um, you can send a lot of light through human bodies. So if you take a flash and stick it inside, the, inside somebody's throat and trigger the flash, you can see light go all the way through the mouth, coming out through their lips, also through the throat, and all other places. You can also see that the light <coughs> is predominantly red, and that turns out to be important. Because not only is human flesh, it also has color. Um, most of the color from human flesh comes from hemoglobin, which is the red pigment inside blood. And hemoglobin has, <laughs> hemoglobin has a few different forms. One of the forms is oxyhemoglobin, or oxygenated blood uh, pigment. The other form, one of the other forms is deoxyhemoglobin. Uh, they have different absorption spectra, which is to say that they absorb light at different rates at different wavelengths. So specifically, if we look at 660 nanometers, there's the largest difference between the oxyhemoglobin absorption and the deoxyhemoglobin uh, absorption. And over by 800, the absorption is almost equal. Um, so this device that we have here has two LEDs on it. One is at 660 nanometers, uh, plus or minus 20 LEDs are not single wavelength devices. Uh, the other LED is at 850, which is close, but not exactly this um, crossover isosbestic point. Um, using those two wavelengths, we can measure the color of the blood in a person's body. And color is another way of saying oxygenation. So we can um, measure or approximate the oxygenation of a person's uh, blood. And because light passes through human tissue fairly well, and because photodetectors, uh, especially photodiodes, are very sensitive and linear, we can do this over moderate distances. So this device has a distance between the emitters, the LEDs, and the detector of about uh, three centimeters. So three centimeters from here to here, which means that on average, a photon will penetrate about one and a half centimeters deep into the person's cranium, which gives us the surface of the cortex. And blah, blah, blah. Um, the oxygenation of blood in the brain is useful because it's a good metric for overall metabolic activity. When, when energy is used in the brain, that causes more blood flow to, to come to that area. Uh, the mediating factor between in this uh, chain is actually carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide increases blood flow. So when you use oxygen, that produces carbon dioxide, which causes more blood flow to the area, which causes oxygen levels to increase. Um, and this is the principle behind fMRI, uh, which is the, the most commonly used imaging, neuroimaging technique in neuroscience today. So it's a, a very well understood mechanism. The point of doing this is that when you're doing these kinds of measurements, you can do them in real time. And given real time feedback about somebody's body, most people can learn how to control that, that uh, signal. And this applies for many different types of signals. This applies for heart rate. This applies for um, skin conductance, how sweaty your palms are. If you're told in real time how sweaty and how electrically conductive your skin is, you can learn how to control that. You can also learn how to control your finger temperature. And as it so happens, you can learn how to control brain blood oxygenation as well. And it's not too hard. About 60% of people can get decent control of their brain blood oxygenation within a couple of minutes. But their 40% usually take a few hours of practice, but they also usually get it. So uh, what we're seeing here is my diagnostic software written in Python, of course. Um, and it shows three signals. There are also some other signals down below, but they're not as important. The middle one is the infrared signal. So this is the 850 nanometer light. Below we have the red. And the top is the ratio of these two, uh, which gives us an oxygenation uh, metric. And as you can see, there are a lot of spikes in the raw red, sorry, red and infrared signals. And that's because he's not dead. Um, specifically, his heart's still beating, and it doesn't have those mechanical hearts that are uh, uh, programming pumps instead of missing pumps. Um, you can also see that there are some long-term changes on the order of 0.1 hertz. Those are called Meyer waves, or Valsalva waves, uh, for some other people. And those are variations in blood pressure that are mostly, or sort of uh, indirectly, in, in uh, influenced by breathing in some complicated ways. Uh, you can also see some large spikes. Those are motion artifacts. So if you move your eyebrows, there'll be some large spikes that will be very short in transit. Um, these large spikes and these uh, Meyer waves show up very well in the raw um, absorbance or transmittance data, but they don't show up very well in the uh, ratio data, the oxygenation data. And that's the main point of taking that ratio. Total blood volume is really interesting, and um, great thing to measure if you can measure it, but it's hard to measure because there's a lot of noise sources that influence that. 
the, the, most of the noise sources that influence each of these raw readings um, e influence them equally, and so don't influence the ratio very much. Um, so uh, one of the cool things about this program is that what it's actually doing is taking the text in this uh, box and evaluating it, running eval on that text with a set of global and local variables. So if I do this, then all the values get divided by 20. If I decide that I want to um, take the square root of it, I can do that. Um, if I want to normalize it, I can do that too. So uh, this didn't actually change anything on the shape of the graph, but if you looked at the left side, you could see changes on, on the axis. We can also normalize this. And um, we can let's see two and three. We can overlay them so that they're both on the same graph. Um, and uh, the, these graphs are just the WX Python uh, plot widget. So um, there are a few things that I've added to allow right clicking and stuff like that. But all the graphing is done by WX Python. So the graphing is actually oh, and, and that WX Python widget uses NumPy as its backend. So it's relatively fast. You can do um, 100,000 point graphs without too much trouble. So uh, yeah, if we want, we can also clip um, let's see, up to 0 0.95. Um, so right now we're measuring from the dorsal prefrontal cortex. Um, 
there tends to be an antagonistic or inhibitory relationship between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system, the um, lower down, deeper emotional areas of the brain. So that when the limbic system is heavily active, that tends to shut down the prefrontal cortex and vice versa. Um, so if he gets irritated, that's likely to shut down his prefrontal cortex and make his limbic system more active. So that will tend, that should tend to make it uh, make the signal decrease. Um, that said, it's often hard to interpret things uh, on a single trial basis. So you might only be able to see this if you had him in a randomized fashion, either think of puppies, uh, unless puppies are annoying, uh, and then uh, think of something that annoys him, um, maybe rabbit puppies, uh, uh -huh. um, and then average all those trials together and, and compare them. There's just so much variation in what's going on in a person's brain normally that it's hard to pick out a single uh, trial things. Um, usually what does activate this or make things go forward and make that graph on top go up is a sort of, excuse my hand waviness, but a, um, a Jedi focus type, mind trick type thing. If you use the force in a really cheesy way and um, suspend your disbelief about whether or not you can control um, your reality just by thinking about things moving and just will it to move, that tends to work more often than not. Um, it seems that most people tap into a, a distilled concentration focus state that involves a lot of prefrontal activity, and that um, state gets picked up and gets translated into forward motion. So when people concentrate and focus and will really hard for them to move forward, they tend to move forward. When they concentrate and focus and will really hard for them to move backward, they move forward. Uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't care which direction you're focusing on, just that you're focusing. Anyway, so um, this software uh, took me, it took me a while to get it to work this well because um, that landscape you're seeing is not real-time generated. It's uh, basically an Abbey file. And um, what I'm doing is I'm decoding one frame from the Abbey file and displaying it on the screen. Uh, and when it moves backward, I seek to a previous frame. And when it moves, when it moves forward, I seek to a uh, subsequent uh, frame. And um, I like to do things in a cross-platform manner. And cross-platform uh, toolkits or um, libraries for decoding videos are either only C++ or C or Lang. So um, I struggled a lot with different things to get that to work. There was a, um, a media control widget in WX Python, which worked pretty well. Um, it worked really well on OS X. It worked OK on Windows XP. Didn't work at all on Linux. Um, and then Windows 7 came out, and the, that widget for Windows used the um, Windows Media Player ActiveX control, along with some a little bit of direct show stuff. And uh, the, the ActiveX control for Windows Media Player versions 10 and earlier uh, would display frames if you had the video paused and you seeked, which was perfect for me. And in Windows Media Player version 11 and later, it didn't display frames if it was paused. So that stopped working with Windows 7. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm actually using mPlayer as a separate process. And uh, you can communicate with mPlayer using a, a pipe. So I'm t just telling uh, mPlayer via a pipe, seek space um, x percent whenever I want to seek to that position. And um, mPlayer can also, on Windows and I think on Linux or uh, on Unix, uh, it can display onto any uh, window handle that you display that you give to it. So I just give mPlayer a window handle on startup, and uh, mPlayer handles all the rendering, all the rendering and all the decoding uh, for that video file. So um, this saves me from having to do any direct 3D or OpenGL code for um, displaying the video. mPlayer handles all the acceleration itself. Um, so that works pretty well, but I can't do that on OS 10 because mPlayer doesn't know how to dump things into handles on OS 10. So yeah. Uh, platform makers. Anyway, um, blah blah software, blah blah brain stuff. Having fun? Yes, yes. Yeah, so the idea behind this is that if you do biofeedback like this for a while, um, you can increase your brain's ability to uh, either do uh, cognitive metabolic work or to um, have blood supply to that area. So on the left is before doing sessions with this instrument, on the right 
is after, I think, 30 sessions, um, these are spec images, or a single photon emitted computer tomography images. It's kind of like PET. It's a uh, imaging method that uses a radioactive tracer. Um, but instead of, well, that's complicated. What this does is it just measures where blood is flowing and how much blood is flowing to each area. Um, so blue areas indicate lower than average for that age and sex uh, blood flow. Uh, yellow areas indicate average, red areas indicate red and white indicate uh, above average. And on the left you see the legend in standard deviations. So this is like a little bit over two standard deviations above normal. And as you can see, blood uh, flow below normal before, um, roughly normal afterwards, although there are still some areas, especially in the anterior cingulate area, that still have hypoactivity. And another person with a different issue. Similar things, a lot of the hypoactivity, lower activity in like the temporal regions uh, was resolved after doing, I think this was more like 20 sessions. But, so whether this actually helps people in the long run with whatever they want to be helped with is still technically up for debate. There's been a lot of data that's been collected on this question. All the data sucks. Uh, um, most of the people who've been doing these experiments, including my grandfather, have not been collected under control groups because doing so is expensive and complicated. Um, so it's hard to say whether it works from a purely scientific perspective. But it's promising. So that's where we are now. Yeah. How does it uh, come back to the <coughs> traditional EMR techniques? So this is uh, what you call near-infrared uh, imaging. Near infrared spectroscopy is um, or functional near infrared spectroscopy, FNERS. Um, so uh, MRI has a few different variants. There is the standard structural MRI um, technique, which just gives you an image of the, the shape of the brain, where the cortex is, where the, the white matter is, how much of each you have, how large the vegetables are, whether there are any anomalies like scars or, or other things like that. Um, there's also the T2 star wave imaging which gives you a, an image that's mostly structural but has a small functional component to overlay on it. Um, so the T2 star weighted signal gives you about 2% um, or so of the total signal as a functionally dependent component to that signal. So with that T2 star thing, if you take two images at different times and then subtract them, what you're left with is almost exclusively functional information. Um, and that's the, the, the imaging method that they use for fMRI, functional magnetic like resonance imaging. And that's the imaging that uh, is almost always used when you see images of the brain with like a heat map overlaid on top of it saying area X of the brain is involved in task Y. Um, now, fMRI requires a superconducting magnet. It requires uh, a few liters of liquid helium and many liters of liquid nitrogen. Um, the instrument itself costs about $3 million. Um, and what it does is it measures essentially cerebral blood oxygenation. The, the functional um, aspect of the T2 star weighted signal is actually hemoglobin oxygenation. Oxyhemoglobin has different magnetic properties compared to deoxyhemoglobin. Um, so we're measuring the same thing. We're also measuring blood oxygenation, but we're doing it through an optical method instead of a magnetic method. And um, that means that we don't need to conduct magnets, which drops the price by you know, a small amount. Um, but it also means that uh, light's a lot harder to direct and to manipulate. Um, in a brain than, it, than our magnetic fields because uh, human tissue scatters light tremendously. So it's a lot harder for an instrument like this to get good spatial resolution. Um, it's quite easy for uh, fMRI to get good spatial resolution to get spatial resolution on the order of two millimeters or so, sometimes as low as a quarter millimeter per voxel. Um, and you get something like, I don't know, four centimeters uh, or four cubic centimeters per voxel. So, um, Oh, and this also has much better temporal resolution. You can take as many samples per second as you want. Currently, I'm taking 10 weeks and it's going to have made it faster than it's going to be easier. But um, um, fMRI is limited to sampling rates of around. Um, I've seen some, some newer stuff get down to about 200 milliseconds, but traditionally, it's about two seconds per sample. Um, so when you have two second samples, you have interesting issues with um, heart uh, or pulse aliasing, your sampling rate's much slower than the pulse, so you're going to get each sample at a different uh, part of the, the cardiac cycle, which is going to be, you'll have some motion uh, compensation issues and so sort of stuff. Um, so 
so there's a lot of noise and fMRI data measurements. Not enough noise to make it uh, not work. It's just a, a omnipresent issue in the back of fMRI. Um, yeah. Anyway, there are a bunch of other differences too, but that gives you a start. Oh yeah, you, you don't have to worry about having the middle of your body when you take something like this. Um, so. Other questions? I'm basically done. So, so in your case, so you use numpy dot under under dict, right? That's a dictionary. So I, I uh, use the numpy namespace namespace as the initialization for the local variables uh, that I use for the evaluation statement. Yeah. So it, it's just to make all the numpy functions uh, easily available, like sign or uh, potential or whatever. Does it have a difference between numpy dict and normal Python dict? No, it's not a numpy dict. Okay. It's a regular Python dict. But the, the contents of that dict are the numpy dot underscore underscore dict underscore underscore uh, variable. So it's just that's where I'm going to find my um, my values for sticking to that dict. The underscore underscore dict underscore underscore um, uh, property is the namespace for whatever module you're working with. So you can use that with anything else. If you, if you just want to copy namespace for some module, you can just copy that date. It's also, I think, what is returned by DIR. So if you do DIR space numpy, then it'll give you uh, that date. Or I guess actually it'll just give you the, the keys for that date, but it's almost the same. Other questions? Why you Ah, um, because I think it'll help people, and because it's cool. Yeah, that's most of it. Okay, so I purchased some uh, uh, another headset called the Mindwave from a company, Neurosky. Yeah. Right? And um, it lets you do a whole lot of fun things, like you know, you look at animals on screen and blink to shoot and things like that. But I got out of all of that maybe within days. I think yeah. it was interesting. And now what I do is when I start to read, I start off a journal over there. And I am training myself to learn to focus better. Because uh, I don't know how to quantify this, but I just am able to teach myself to focus better. I look at the graphs occasionally, or I set an alarm or something. And what I have found is, uh, some 10 minutes after I have started to read is when I am able to really focus. And what also happens is in case someone disturbs me, it can take me a good 10 to 15 minutes to focus it. So it has some things. I'm sure you have probably researched this. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of behavioral data on uh, focus and concentration and interruptions. And it also tends to show that after an interruption, it takes usually 10 15 minutes or so um, before a person gets back into the task. There's a lot of data that's been done specifically on programming, too. Um, so, one of the issues with programming is that it's a high working memory load task. You have to have a lot of your mind in order to program effectively. You have to keep in mind several different local variables. You have to keep in mind um, the functions of a few different modules. And uh, getting those things into working memory takes about a fair amount of time. Um, and as soon as you're interrupted, all that stuff leaves your working memory and is replaced by, I don't know, um, cricket or whatever. Um, so uh, and then it takes another 10 minutes to get, back, get it back in. And if you're uninterrupted, then you can keep those things in working memory and, and actually get stuff done. Um, so uh, yeah, the NeuroSky system is measuring brain activity patterns. It's measuring the electrical activity um, and the electrical measurements that you can make are actually um, a lot more indirect than metabolic measurements. Even though neurons are primarily electrical and um, blood flow is it's more of a secondary trait, it's, it seems to me that the blood flow correlates better with the overall metabolic or the overall um, activity level of neurons, whereas the, the electrical activity just shows patterns of information flow. Um, and the reason for this just comes from the way neurons are shaped within the cortex. Um, so when a neuron receives information from another neuron, you get an electrical dipole. You get a current flowing in one direction at that neuron synapse, and that produces a dipole that you can sense um, on any line uh, perpendicular or parallel to that uh, dipole. So if you have one electrode on one side of that line and another electrode on the other side of the line, 
you can see a, a voltage difference. If, on the other hand, your electrodes are oriented uh, perpendicularly to that line, you'll see nothing. You might also have other neurons oriented in the opposite direction, so that when they receive information, they produce another dipole in the opposite direction. If you put those two next to each other, and you put your electrodes at some distance away on the skin, uh, you'll see nothing on average. You'll see a very, very small signal because they'll cancel out. Um, so when you do get stuff from neurons making it to the scalp in EEG, what's usually happening is you have a large number of parallel neurons in one area um, all receiving information at the same time. So it's the synchronicity um, or the synchrony of uh, information flow that primarily drives EEG rhythms. And one of the most synchronous rhythms, or one of the most synchronous set of, sets of rhythms in uh, brain activity are the idle rhythms. So the largest rhythm that you see in EEG by far is the alpha rhythm. The amount of time that it takes for a signal to go from the visual cortex to the switch yard of the brain, the thalamus, and back is roughly 100 milliseconds. Incidentally, the alpha rhythm is about 10 hertz, so 100 milliseconds. Um, when the brain, when the visual system is not doing anything, and it's not processing information, there's still a tendency for neurons to fire, and the neurons will fire from the visual cortex and send information to the thalamus, and then those neurons will fire and send information back to the cortex, and this will go on and on for a while. There's some positive feedback there, so each time it goes through this loop, the signal gets amplified, until eventually you have a big sinusoid wave waveform going on between the visual cortex and uh, the thalamus, and that only stops if you interrupt it with some chaotic uh, high entropy data, like looking around. Um, so if you close your eyes, the alpha rhythm shows up very strongly. If you open your eyes, it gets diminished. So that, that big rhythm is actually just your brain doing nothing. Um, and the actual activity is what shuts down that rhythm. So um, the, that synchrony measure, though, is still quite useful. It tells you something about what the rhythms are in the brain and what kind of mental state is going on. Uh, which is why I can show some information about focus or um, attention. Um, so the NeuroSky guys tried to tap into that and tried to distill some metrics that um, attract or that, uh, that relate to that. Um, however, those measures are, or most of the other measures that you can get with ED are hard to control because they don't map onto the overall activity of the brain. It doesn't map onto our uh, subjective experience of actually thinking or doing some task as well. And that's a generalization, but all generalizations are false. But, and also I'm biased, um, because I'm competing with that side. But, um, so yeah, um, this is not, so with NeuroSky and other EEG systems, it's more of a brain state kind of thing. It's uh, getting into a certain mindset, um, or getting into a certain mood. Um, with this, with HEG, or near infrared spectroscopy biofeedback, it's much more of an exercise. It's much more of a pushing yourself to use your brain harder and to think and will harder um, than you normally do. So uh, they're very different uh, systems. Any other questions before I get out of here and let you guys talk about something else? And you can ask questions or not. If you like questions, you can All right. Congratulations, you're free. Uh, 